Hi guys, John Bishop here with John Bishop Fine Art, and you're listening to the podcast Art Life. Welcome back. Listen, I don't think I ever believed I would be able to say this, but it has finally happened. We have finally been granted our 501c3 status by the IRS uh, here in the United States, naming our nonprofit, Arepa Arte, as a tax exempt uh, public charity. So that means that we are official. Uh, this has been a long time coming, over a year. And, uh, you know, I've always been really tentative talking about this because. I knew that we didn't have the 501c3 status, and that means that if somebody gives us a donation that they they can declare it on their taxes, they can get a deduction from their taxes for giving to charity. But we didn't have that status yet, and though we figured for sure we would get it because we did all the right things and went through the right processes, but until we had it, I was very tentative to really talk much about it. Because what I found was people were excited at the idea and wanted to know more about it. And, and they wanted to give money, wanted to support us, which is, of course, delightful. But I, I didn't want to let them down. I didn't want to make them, I didn't want to set them up and then say, oh, by the way, we haven't gotten it. Or for, for some godforsaken reason, the IRS were to turn us down, then I would have to say, well, you know, all that money you gave me, well, you can't declare it off your taxes after all. And I didn't want to lie to anybody. So I, I was pretty tentative in, in discussing anything about the nonprofit. Um, but it has been a year long process. And we got the letter yesterday evening in the mail. I found it in my mailbox yesterday. And it declared that we have, they have reviewed us and have determined that we are a uh, tax-exempt public charity in the States. Uh, you don't know how good that feels. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I wouldn't talk about it before, but I'm going to talk about it now. <laughs> so basically, yeah, we the, the process was a long one. When I, and I, had always, I had always heard that it was a long process. And so I said, okay, well, let me let me learn as much as I can. We opened the company in December, late December in 2022. And then January of 2023, I went looking and I found this application and it was three pages long. And I said, well, that doesn't seem so onerous. Let me see if I, if I know how to answer all the questions. And I did. So I answered all the questions and I filled out my three pages and there was a button that said submit. So I hit submit. Well, a couple of weeks later, I got an email and a letter saying that, hi, my name is so-and-so. I've been assigned as an agent to review your application. I have some questions. Uh, and there were six pages of questions. And so I filled out all those six pages of questions as best I could. And I sent all the information back thinking, okay, wow, you know, that was lucky, but now I've answered all their questions. Well, I waited again. And after a couple of months, I got this, this really brief, and I, I don't know, it felt angry letter saying, we've looked at your file. You can't use the short form start over. Oh my God, I was already like three months into the process. And, and I said, okay. So I went and looked at the long form. Short form is three pages. The long form, I think, was 28 pages. I didn't even understand most of the questions they were asking, not to mention how I would devise answers. So I kind of panicked inside, and I said, you know what? I'm going to hire an attorney. I, I can't do this. There is 100% chance I will mess this up, and it's just going to cause more delays, or God forbid they would get angry and say no. So I went, I went out looking. I found an attorney in San Diego, California. His name is Dean Sage, uh, Dean Sage Law. And Dean works specifically with uh, 501c3 nonprofits. And so he began to set out to 
review the information that we had submitted and that we had prepared and all the documents for forming the company as a nonprofit in Texas. And Dean pretty quickly came up with several things that were kind of red flags saying, you know, you need to deal with this before we submit it or they're going to tell you no or they're going to ask more questions. Let's make this a, as good an application as we can possibly make it. And so we did. We had to rewrite the bylaws. I'm not saying they were all wrong, but they were glaring omissions. There were things with the number of the board and the makeup of the board. There were other issues about policies against uh, um, uh, harassment and things like that. There are just various things that we needed to have a stronger presence. And there was like there was one section, for example, saying, you know, how are you going to guarantee that the money given to you is not being given to you by terrorists or that there's somebody laundering money through your nonprofit. Well, I had no idea. I had never considered that. I, I, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, you know, it's a thing. Apparently, it's quite a big thing, uh, particularly abroad, that a lot of people launder money through NGOs or nonprofits. So, yeah, we had to come up with a way to address that that situation. And we did. And and could not have done it without Dean. Uh, that made all the difference in the world, hiring a, an attorney. Um, so anyway, uh, it took a lot more time than, than we thought it would, but we did get it submitted. And after uh, many months, uh, it was finally approved last night. Um, so that now means that we are official. We are full-fledged. We can now do anything. And uh, it brings up the question, who are we and what it is, what is it that we're actually doing? Um, the name of the nonprofit is Arepa Arte, which Arepa means wing in Romanian. And the whole idea of Arepa Arte is for us to provide support to visual artists in Romania. And that, that's kind of a broader term that might need to be explained. We're not only talking about people who are born in Romania and live in Romania. We're talking about people who are from Romania, but have moved outside of Romania because a lot of people have moved outside of Romania, particularly artists trying to create their, their careers, as well as people who live in Romania who are not Romanian, but are working artists in Romania. And so that takes care of all the, the particularly young people after communism fell and after uh, the Romania became part of the European Union, the borders opened up and people could go and work outside. Well, lots of people did, and particularly lots of young people did. And so artists, many artists moved abroad so that they could pursue a career in the arts uh, that they couldn't do staying in Romania. And so there are a lot of Romanian artists in the States, in Europe, but particularly in, in Berlin, in Madrid, in, in Paris, and Vienna. And these people are pursuing their art. They are Romanian, but they're not in Romania. Uh, so they're covered, as well as, you know, Romania has a long border with Ukraine, and there are a lot of Ukrainian refugees who've moved over from Ukraine into the safety of the the NATO country of, of Romania. And so that also allows us to help the, Roma the uh, Ukrainian refugees who are artists and uh, living, trying to remake and <laughs> we put you know put their lives back together while this horrifying war goes on. Uh, so that's who we're serving. Uh, and uh, you know we run our own art business here in the United States, and it's tough. I mean, it's a weird way to make a living. Uh, we have a hard time. Can you imagine what it's like for Romanians? And, and uh, you you have to kind of understand the mentality for ex-communist countries. Um, these folks under communism, artists, writers, poets, sculptors, even athletes, uh, were all considered very, very important. And they were highly, uh, highly supported and highly uh, regarded uh, professions, but only for a very, very few. I mean, you were, it was very competitive. Uh, you look at, at, at people you might know, uh, Nadia Comaneci. These people who competed in the Olympics, they trained from little
little bitty kids and they, if you didn't make the cut, you were out. If you were an athlete, if you were an artist, if you were a writer, it was because you were the best that that country had to offer. And if you, you know, even the universities were like that. You just didn't get in. There were very few seats. You didn't get in. You had a different life. And that was very much the case for artists. And, and some of those people are still around and they were given lovely lives, homes, good, uh, good salaries, the studios for their entire lives. Uh, they were given, uh, you know, exposure outside of Romania as well as support with ins inside Romania. Um, and those folks, some of them are still around. So there's this new generation of artists who really don't stand a chance because they, they, that, that previous support system is gone. And yet there's this mentality that in order to be an artist, you have to be the best artist. And if you're not the best artist, well, then you're wasting your time. Um, that's a hard nut to crack. And, and, my spouse, uh, Bogdan, is Romanian. We have that tie to Romania. And, uh, you know, I see this in, in him as well. And he has worked hard since I've known him to, to kind of branch out and get away from some of that mentality that says, you know, if I am not properly trained by the right people in the right places, then uh, I'm nobody and I'll never make it. And... If I do make it, it's a gift that I should, uh, I'm lucky. Not something I worked for, but something that was given to me. So once you kind of understand that mentality, man, I think there's a great bit of service we can do for Romanian artists. And I say artists, I mean visual artists. We're not dealing with musicians and dancers and things like that. Um, but... For the folks now, I mean, there's just no, there's no market. There, there are very few people in Romania. There's not a lot of money in Romania. And those who do have money and those who do collect art, well, there's only a certain amount of bandwidth they have uh, to collect art. And so the only way to make it in now is to be supported by a gallery or by the museums. And those certainly opportunities exist. But let's face it. There's very few, there's only a certain amount of bandwidth those folks have to find artists and support artists. Uh, they can't do everybody. And if you are waiting for that kind of support, you may or may not find it. Uh, so basically what, what artists need is they need access to the outside markets, to the rest of Europe and things like that. Well, if you are of starving artist in Romania, and you know that the only way you're gonna sell art is to go to the shows in Berlin or in, in London, that might not be available to you. And so what do you do? You can't stay in Romania and be an artist. And if you can't leave Romania to be an artist, then you have to give up on art. Or you just have to do it and, and, and realize you know, because it's your passion, and realize that you'll never live off your art. Uh, you just, you have to have access to those larger markets, and there's no local market. Uh, and so that, that's where we step in. You know, what can we do? We can offer customized support for artists that we work with. Now, obviously, different artists are at different levels, and they're going to have different needs and what works for one artist who is well established and needs opportunities to get to the Biennale in Venice versus somebody who just needs to get decent art supplies. Maybe they can't, they can't afford a canvas. You know what I mean? Each one can have their own trajectory and we can support them based upon their needs and their goals for their, their art career. And uh, we want to come and work from outside the system. So we don't want to compete with anything going on in Romania. We don't want to become a gallery. We don't want to take away funding from museums. We, 
we don't want to compete with the art schools and the ateliers and the and the various other organizations that are supporting the arts in Romania. We want to bolster all of that. We don't want to detract from it. And so what we intend to do is come from outside the system, collect money outside of Romania and bring it in, support everyone, specifically with customized programming, uh, uh, customized, not programming, but uh, you know, work plans, uh, business plans for art businesses in, in Romania. We want a successful, vibrant art market in Romania. That helps everybody. And we don't want to put anybody out of business. That would be the last thing we want to do. And so we, we can help artists in five different ways. First of all, we offer funds. We offer money to give them the things that they need, where those, those questions that can be answered by, by money, we can help support that by donations and, and uh, uh, maybe grant writing that we do. We also want to collaborate. We want to work with the local galleries and museums and art schools. We want to support them and maybe help with the programs that they're uh, initiating and making sure they've got the support that they need to succeed. Because again, we want them to succeed because they can help our artists. Uh, we also want to offer, offer um, educational opportunities. We did a lot of surveying and nobody said they wanted educational uh, help. And yet, instantly when you're having a conversation with an artist or a gallery owner, there are all kinds of things. They'll say, yeah, I have a real problem with my artists. They can't talk about their art. Well, you know, that's an educational issue. We can help. We can probably find programs. We can hire someone to work with them, you know, whatever it is they need. There are lots of ways that we can help in education that is not formalized. And I think they didn't say they wanted education because they assume that we mean getting a degree in art. Uh, so educational opportunities we can provide. We also want to provide cultural programming. You know, if we're going to sell the idea that people can support Romanian artists, uh, by giving to our, our foundation or to our nonprofit, uh, they need to understand what Romanian art is. We need to bridge that with outside markets so that people are interested in learning about what Romanian artists are doing. And there's a rich artistic tradition in Romania. And there's some really exciting things going on right now. Uh, but we need to be able to let people know that. And that may mean taking Westerners, or taking tourists, art tourists, to Bucharest and letting them meet the artists and go to the galleries and, and see the museums and, and do some cultural programming by taking folks to Romania or bringing Romanians here and doing programming around wherever we're, we're working. And that could be writing books. It could be doing various things, providing you know online content as well. But really kind of selling the idea that, hey, there's a cultural thing going on in Romania that is creating a certain kind of art that you should know about. And finally, um, we do kind of, we want to have exchange and residency opportunities so that maybe people can change places so that we can get Romanians here to do either residency programs or maybe to, to do tours or whatever and maybe provide opportunities for Westerners to go to Romania and spend some time working there. So those are the five areas that we can help ro Romanian artists. And, uh, and of course we do all of that by raising money. And we can finally do that uh, officially. So uh, we can raise money, we can give them individualized plans and all of that, uh, you know, we need support. So you can help us, we would appreciate it. I'll be certainly asking that more in the future, but we are so ecstatically happy that this, uh, this hurdle has finally been met, uh, we are, are, are surpassed, that uh, we can now function as nonprofit, tax-free public charity in the United States. We are stoked. Anyway. That's what we've been up to. Hope you guys are having a great week and uh, I'll talk to you next time. Bye now.